Welcome to the Long Beach Unified School District Local Control Accountability Plan Community Forum. I am Melissa Taylor Stewart, coordinator with the LBUSD RAP Expanded Learning Program, and I am so grateful that you are here with us today. On behalf of the LBUSD Board of Education, our esteemed superintendent, Dr. Jill Baker, the executive staff, Mr. Robert Tugorda, Director of Equity Access College and Career Readiness, as well as our dedicated community partners, the Children's Defense Fund of California, Public Advocates, Latinos in Action, the Parent Organization Network, and all staff, parents, and community members who are part of this committee, I welcome you to today's forum, Directing Resources for Student Success, A Journey Forward. You know, it's often said that life is a journey and not a destination. A journey indicates movement from one place to the next. It also suggests growth and progress. Today, we invite you to journey with us together, together. as an educational community, reflecting on what is, yet looking forward and working together to create the best possible educational outcomes for all of our students. We encourage you to engage and participate in today's forum. We will be monitoring the chat. It will be open and closed periodically, but we'll, we'll see you there. So please feel free to share your ideas and questions. Again, thank you for sharing your Saturday morning with us. You are appreciated. I'd like to welcome one of our parents and one of our LB, uh, LCAP Community Forum Committee members, Mrs. Mariela Salgado. She's gonna share with you the goals of today's forum as well as today's agenda. Take it away, Mariella. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mariela Salgado, a, as you said, a parent of two and a district community advisory committee member. Um, if I may have the slides pulled up, please. I will go through the purpose and agenda. So this Mariela, morning, Mariela, yes. I think we skipped the land acknowledgement. We're going to do that first. Go ahead. So let's, let's go back for a second. You can take the you can take the slides down. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kim. I'm a parent in the district. Um, before I begin, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the recent murders of 20-year-old Dante Wright, killed by the Minnesota police on April. 11th, 2021, and the murder of 16-year-old Makia Bryant killed in Ohio by the Ohio police on April 20th. We send deep love to their family and to their community. We condemn all state violence, especially violence against Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Asian Americans, and other people of color. It's really important for us to center what is happening in the world right now, so I really wanted to take a moment to say that. Can folks what? mute themselves if they're not speaking? What is this? The tech team help with that. Thank you. We know it's Saturday morning and the kids are up and about, so it's all good. Today, we want to acknowledge that we are on the sacred land of the Tongva Nation, also known as Long Beach, California. The colonization of this land reflects the systems of power upon which this country was founded and which continue to operate today. We honor the Tangva and all indigenous people past, present and future and their continued survival and contributions in our society. We also honor the legacy of the African diaspora and recognize that this country could not exist without the free enslaved labor of black people. We know that contemporary struggles for black lives are connected to our history of violence and white supremacy. We share these acknowledgements for three reasons. One, to pay respects to the original caretakers of the land, two, to raise awareness about histories that are too often erased or forgotten, and three, to affirm our commitment to social change. So please take a moment, feel the feet under, feel the ground underneath your feet and honor the land. Thank you. Back to you, Mariella. Thank you, Kim, for that land acknowledgement. So as I said, we were gonna we're gonna go through our purpose and agenda this morning. So if I can have those slides come up. So today we're gonna create a dialogue between the district staff and families on pandemic recovery investments, 
in the draft LCAP to ensure an equitable and restorative return to school. Next slide. So here's what's happening this morning as um, we're, we're now on uh, the forum purpose, LCFF LCAP overview. We will have a presentation on English learners and language access. We'll have a panel of social uh, around social emotional learning. Panel number two will be on Pacific Islander and Black student achievement. We'll take a very brief break. Um, a keynote speaker, we have Dr. Tyrone Howard, professor of education from UCLA, and then we'll have a closing. We will have um, a, the chat disabled during the panelists, just to make sure we have everyone's attention. There will be a breakout, optional breakout sessions at the end, if you all are still available and willing, we'd love to get some more of your feedback. Just to mention on the top right corner, you will see on your Zoom meeting a view, you can click it and see it, whether you wanna see speaker view or gallery view, um, but uh, those are available to you just to make sure you can view us uh, if you're not on YouTube. Thank you for joining us and I'll send it back to Kim. Oops, forgot the mute button. All right, we just wanna know who's in the room. So we want to know, um, you know, there's a, there's a poll that just popped up. So just let us know um, who's here. We want a quick pulse check. Are you a parent? Are you a student? Are you an educator? Are you a community member? Just click on one of those. Um, don't click on all of them. Just click on how you are showing up today. So you may be a parent and an educator, but are you here today as a parent? Are you here today as an educator? That's, I know we wear multiple hats, but let's try to pick one. How are we showing up here today? And for those of you that can't see the poll, um, if you're on your phones or something, you can certainly write it in the chat. But if folks can, uh, just, just do a quick poll. How are you showing up today? In what, in what, in what area? All right. So I don't know. I if we're good, if folks want to take another minute to click, if you're a parent or if you're a student or if you're an educator, another thirty seconds, and then the tech team can close the polls so we have an idea. All right, tech team, can you close the polls so we can see what, uh, can we show the results of the polls? Thank you, everybody. All right, so we've got 50% of us here as parents. Yes, we've got 35% educators. We've got 15% community members, 14% advocates, and a couple of policymakers. I am so, so excited. We are going to have a rich, rich conversation, so don't go anywhere. All right, take it away, y'all. Poll number two. Yes, there's a second poll. I forgot about that. What is your level of familiarity with the district and school budgeting process, things like the local control accountability plan, the things that we're talking about today? What are your what is your availability with some of these um, things? All right, another 30 seconds here, tech team. If folks don't know what these initials mean, then you definitely aren't familiar with them. But so we'll, we'll get you familiar with them, don't worry. We got a lot of acronyms in education, so stay tuned for lots of learning today. All right, tech team, go ahead and close the poll. And let's see the results. All right, we got a lot of people very familiar, a lot of people familiar, some people are somewhat familiar, and we have a huge segment of the population that are um, unfamiliar. So a good journey of learning today. We know that from the folks that have registered, at least half of you, this is your first LCAP, know that this is our sixth forum. I believe it's our final forum. Um, so thank you for being here, and we will make sure that the panelists that are speaking today are using the languages with folks that this, this is your first time hearing this information. So we'll keep that in mind throughout the day. Thank you.
Thank you, Kim. I um, wanted to, good morning, everyone. My name is Jerlene Tatum. I am a planning committee member or a committee member of the planning team for this event. I am a LBUSD parent. But I just want to um, tech team real quick. Please check our Zoom access because it shows that we have 100 participants and it seems as if some people are unable to access. So can our tech team please take a look at that to make sure that additional um, folks are able to access. So again, thank you, Kim, for that poll. And it's really exciting to see who's in the room. Um, can we go ahead and pull up the next slide? Well, while that slide That's is coming up, <laughs> while this slide is uh, coming up, um, building parent and uh, building parent student community power in the decision making process here in Long Beach. Uh, just wanted to give a very short history of why we're here. In 2013, um, LCFF became the law of the land. The governor basically said, "This is how school districts are going to." Um, distribute money across the district. And part of that includes input from parents, teachers, community stakeholders. Um, in 2017, there was a complaint that was filed out of the community because the community felt like there was some things that were kind of amiss. But what came out of that complaint is this wonderful collaboration of community and school district staff um, and community stakeholders and community partners. And that's why we're here today delivering this forum as a collaborative effort um, to gather input from the community. And going back to our last poll question of like who is familiar with LCFF, we're gonna bring in one of our community partners to talk about what LCFF is because if we don't know what it is, we can't be part of the process. So um, can we go ahead and pull Nicole forward? All right, she's got All right. Thanks. in 10 minutes. Thanks, Jerlene. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Nicole Gon Ochi. I'm here representing public advocates, a nonprofit legal organization. And I've had the great pleasure of working alongside the powerful parents that put together this forum uh, and that have been advocating in Long Beach for, for many years. Um, so my goal is to answer these three questions in 10 minutes so that we're all on the same page. Those questions are, one, what is the local control funding formula? Two, what is the local control accountability plan? And three, how can we use the LCAP to transform Long Beach schools? We don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna go over these slides really quick, but I just want you to know that you can look at them in more detail in the chat. We'll actually be coming out with a video explaining some of these concepts uh, more fully in the next week or so. And please stay around for the breakouts if you wanna engage in a deeper conversation. So question number one, what is the local control funding formula? Um, the local control funding formula is the way that the state allocates money to school districts in California. And it's based on equity, right? It's an equitable funding formula that re really recognizes um, that more resources must be directed towards students who face greater challenges to reach their full potential. So let's watch a short video to learn more about LCFF. California's public schools receive billions in tax dollars under the Local Control Funding Formula, or LCFF. Under LCFF, high-need students bring extra funds to their districts and charter schools that must be used to provide better services for them. The goal is to ensure every student succeeds, especially those the system has historically left behind. Low-income students of color, English learners, and foster youth. Spending under LCFF is spelled out in plans called LCAPs, which parents, students, and teachers must review and help shape. There's big money involved. For example, LA Unified gets more than $1 billion each year in special LCFF funds. High-need students can get shortchanged if districts and charters don't follow LCFF's process closely. You can make sure they get it right by ensuring students receive extra, truly effective services and that community members are directly involved in decision making. That's what it means to deliver on the promise of LCFF. Great, thank you, Angie. Um, <clears throat> so as you could see through that video, that's how LCFF works. 
Um, it's the largest source of funding for California school districts, but it's not the only funding, right? In Long Beach here this year, there's about 715 million in LCFF funds, which is around three quarters of the budget. But there's also other pieces. And the one piece I really want to highlight for you all is that there is a ton of money coming from the federal government. There was 90.5 million this year, and there's going to be 395 million that's either just recently come to the district or will be coming. And so these COVID relief dollars um, also pre present a really unique opportunity to transform Long Beach schools. So we should keep these dollars in mind as we're talking about equitable, equitable budgeting as well. Next slide, please. So second question, what is the LCAP? So the LCAP is a three-year strategic plan for addressing student needs that's updated annually. And right now, Long Beach and other school districts throughout the state are engaged in a new three-year plan. And so this is a really important time to be involved, especially as we're starting to think about how we can recover from the pandemic. It's great that you all are here. Please invite others to continue engaging. Um, so this plan identifies the district's goals to address student needs in eight priority areas that have been identified by the state, which include parent and student engagement and school climate, among others. It lays out the data or metrics that will be used to measure progress towards those goals. And perhaps most importantly, it shows what the district is planning to do to achieve those goals. For example, the programs, the services, the positions that it will fund. A strategic budget document is a statement of values. So you know what the district is prioritizing based on how much it's investing. Something special about the LCAP is that it must be developed in partnership with students, families, and other stakeholders. So that's why we're all here today. Next slide, please. I'm going to really fly through the next set of slides, but this is designed to give you a short tutorial on how to read an LCAP. And Long Beach actually just recently released its first draft LCAP on its website. So I think, um, yeah, Michael already put the, the link in there. So you can go ahead and check that out um, when you have time. Next slide, please. So everything in the LCAP should really be driven by student needs, which can be based on data and or lived experiences of stakeholders. So as you do the LCAP, you should be asking yourself, are the needs of my community and the highest needs students reflected in this plan? Next slide, please. And then based on those needs, the district develops its goals. For example, I believe Long Beach has five goals and all of them are pretty broad. So when you look at those goals and think about the needs of the Long Beach community, ask yourself, is this goal sufficiently targeted and focused to meet the needs? For example, if Long Beach has consistently failed to support Black and Pacific Islanders full potential, or if English learners have particularly and disproportionately been impacted by the pandemic, does it have a goal around that? Should it? If it doesn't, why doesn't it? Next slide, please. After looking at the goals, then you might want to think about how Long Beach is measuring progress towards its goal. It's really important to look at these metrics because we won't really know if we're progressing to meeting the needs if we don't have the right metrics. As you look at the metrics, you should ask yourself if these are the right ones to measure progress. For example, are standardized test scores the best way to assess academic progress or would grades or something else be better? Are the school climate surveys that are used to measure progress on students' sense of belonging, inclusion, and connectedness, are those really asking the right questions? Are the metrics disaggregated? Because we can't know how uh, you know, different students and communities are doing if we can't see that. Are they Okay, next slide, please. So after that, you finally wanna look at the actions that Long Beach is planning to do to meet the goal. You can think to yourself, will these things work? What's missing? Are high need students prioritized? Is there enough money behind this? For example, it's great if restorative justice is in the LCAP. But if it's in the LCAP with only like a $100,000 investment for such a large district, there is reason to be skeptical that it's a priority or that it would be effective in changing culture. So the current LCAP doesn't have expenditures yet, but that's something to watch out for in future drafts. Next slide. Perhaps most importantly, as you look at the LCAP, remember that this is a document that must be created in partnership with community. So the question you should ask yourself is, do you feel heard and seen by this process? And if not, what would make you feel heard and seen? Do you see the students and communities that the district has historically left behind prioritized? All right, next slide, please. 
So in the last um, few minutes, I'm just going to spend a really short time answering this question. How can we use the LCAP to transform LBUSD schools? The short answer is by being here. So thank you all for being here. Um, by being informed, engaged, and bringing your experiences, ideas, and priorities to the district, you are making a difference. So I'm going to skip this slide. The basic purpose of this slide is just to show you that it's, it's a year-round process. But right now, we're basically heading into May and June. Sorry, the next slide is good to stay there. Thank you, Angie. Um, this is where we're at right now. And I just want to give you a little bit of context and a few ideas for what you can do. So right now is the time when districts, including Long Beach, are finalizing LCAPs and budget and holding public hearings. There's a state deadline of June 30th to adopt an LCAP. So what you can do is you can read and analyze draft LCAPs, kind of using the steps that I just went over. You can provide public comment at board meetings about things that you see are missing, um, things you want to see invested in more, goals you want to see prioritized. You can write letters. You can talk to your board members. You can do some media advocacy. And remember, if you're told there's no money, there is that, you know, 400 million plus in federal dollars. So remember to leverage that too. The other thing I wanted to point out really quickly is that this is a key time to ask your district, to ask Long Beach folks, what they're planning to do about summer school and extended learning. You have a right to provide input into these special plans that are being created this district this uh, year because of the pandemic. And that's separate from the LCAP, they're called extended learning opportunity plans. And those are due by June 1st. But make sure you have input in that as well. Next slide. I'm not gonna go over all of these, but I just wanted you all to know that there are four board meetings between now and when the LCAP will be adopted and a multitude of parent meetings that are open to the public, even if you're not a regular member. So I encourage you to go and attend these meetings, to learn more about the LCAP, to put um, your priorities, your community's priorities on the table there. And um, just want to encourage folks, if any of you are on the superintendent's advisory committee or one of the equity leadership teams, please uplift, uplift equity uh, in the LCAP as a priority. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back to Jerlene. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> and you know what? I think you were like at 10 minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> but thank you for giving uh, that, that quick overview of LCAP. The presentation is available for everyone. I think some folks are having a, um, tr a trouble accessing it right now, but yet it will be available on the school district's website. So all, the, all that information that Nicole um, kind of skimmed over, you can read it in detail a little bit later. So now we're going to move to our next presentation that is coming from the Parent Organization Network. Can we please get our folks pulled forward? Can we please get RSLI Simon pulled forward? And I know, and I just want to say this, some of you may be receiving uh, communications from some other parents and colleagues saying that they're unable to access the Zoom. It seems like we are having some kind of Zoom challenge right now, but you know, what is Zoom without a little bit of challenge? So I'm gonna go ahead and bring our Sally forward and she will um, introduce herself and she's gonna give us a short presentation on a very important conversation. Good morning, everyone. My name is Araceli Simeon and I'm the project director for the Parent Organization Network. Juan is working in partnership with Latinos in Action on a project focused on English learners. Um, and you can put the next slide. Two priorities we have identified include addressing both the academic and social emotional needs for English learners and strengthening family school partnerships. Some of our recommendations are based on a study from PACE on the Core Data Collaborative, which found significant learning loss from low-income students and English learners especially um, when it comes to English language arts across grades fourth through ninth and math in the early grades. Next slide. Our recommendations on long-term English learners are based on data from 2019. While the district achieved a high reclassification rate that year, it is important to note that these rates fluctuate depending on student cohorts. And in the past, the reclassification rates for Long Beach Unified have fluctuated between 6.5 percent in 24.3. And so we're concerned about having a growing number of long-term English learners or LTELs because a majority of students in 2019 did not make progress on the LPAC. 
We also see a pipeline of students at risk of becoming or already being classified as LTELs, um, as, as you can see from third through fifth grade and sixth through 12th grade. And an LTEL refers to students who have been enrolled in a school in the US for more than six years, who are not making progress towards English proficiency and who may be struggling academically due to their limited English skills. And this is a factor that prevents ELs from graduating high school, college, and career ready, and that the pandemic is likely to worsen results if proper supports are not given. Next slide. Now we're also concerned about, of course, um, social emotional needs. We know that the pandemic has had an impact on everyone. And we're all able to see in this chart that the results for 2020, um, the district did not meet the goals for all student groups, you know, given the situation. But when we look more closely at the data, when it comes to current English learners, we also see that they, um, they struggled in two of the four categories. So when it comes to, um, in the categories, I know it's a little small to see, but we're looking at developing a growth mindset, self-efficacy, self-management, and social awareness. Next slide. And so when it comes to, again, the social emotional needs and academic success, the district cannot do it alone. And so we are here to, um, to ask that you know, it will be necessary for Long Beach to build stronger family school partnerships, more specifically between parents and teachers. Uh, we have partnered with Cal State LA on a study and preliminary findings show the schools where parents report more connections from school personnel are linked with higher student CAF scores one year later. So we will share the report once it becomes available. Next slide. Last, we want to reinforce that family engagement is a state priority that must be addressed in the LCAP and progress has to be measured annually. And this is done through a self-reflection tool. The tool is supposed to be completed with a diverse group of district school staff and families. And the tool asks the group to rate implementation levels on 12 evidence-based evidence practices on family engagement. Half of those questions focused on supports that the district gives to parents to engage and to support their children. And the other six questions ask about the support in the training being given to classified staff, teachers, counselors, administrators um, to collaborate effectively with parents. A CDE study on the ratings show that overall, a statewide, school districts report greater strength when it comes to providing parents with trainings but they're still building uh, the skill or, or improving um, when it comes to training staff to engage families. One thing that we wanna point out is that when we reviewed Long Beach Unified's ratings, the group or the staff working on this task rated themselves at the highest level possible in all 12 practices. And I'm a little skeptical because a lot of this, um, at least six of these areas uh, can be seen as new. And so my conclusion is that having confidence is good, but overconfidence affects the ability to listen and the humility required to effectively engage others. When we don't engage authentically, it is more difficult to identify and address root causes and to achieve the continuous improvement required by LCFF. And so with this in mind, I want to introduce two parents of English learners with key testimonials. Please listen with an open mind and an open heart. And so next I pass the microphone to Maria Loesa. She will be providing a testimonial on language access in English learners. Bienvenida Maria. Maria, are you here? We might be having some technical difficulties, so I'll go ahead and have it turn her translation in English. My name is Maria Loesa. I have been actively participating in the Long Beach Unified School District for 16 years. I have two daughters attending schools in the district, and I am a leader in Latinos in Action California. 
I would like to address an important issue regarding the inclusion of parents in school committees and at the district level. Problems with accessing good quality simultaneous interpretation during meetings. We as parents who participate in meetings at the district level have notified the people in charge. We have let them know of the existing challenges for the inclusion of parents whose first language is not English. These are some of the challenges. The need for pro having professional and good quality interpretation services. It's not the same to have someone bilingual as opposed to having someone whose profession is to provide interpretation. The current model only allows for parents to hear the information simultaneously, but we cannot actively participate because no time is allowed for interpretation, comments and answering questions. This is not inclusive. It's frustrating how much they forget participants listening on the phone. The district should allow space for clarification and questions instead of waiting until the end of the presentation when the time to respond is limited. There are issues with the phone line. For instance, the wrong number has been shared. Many participants do not know how to mute their phones and this causes confusion. When there are meetings in person, the equipment used during interpretation does not work because it's obsolete. The biggest problem is the lack of willingness, willingness to listen and include parents. Our current participation only exists to minimally comply with the laws, but not to listen to us. This is nothing new. We have shared these issues many times before the previous administrators, but nothing has changed. We want to follow up and answer with answers. By ignoring our needs, LBUSD makes us feel like they don't value our input. If we are not included, how do you expect to improve student achievement? Back to you, Araceli. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, next we have our next testimonial. Uh, her name is Maribel Mireles, but she was one of the participants that got kicked out of Zoom. You know, Zoom kicked her out. And while well, she, she can't get back in because there's a limit to 100, so she's watching this presentation on YouTube and she's listening in Spanish, but unfortunately she's also not gonna be able to um, share her remarks in Spanish. So we're ready again. Yeah. To Así está. Ah, perfecto. Adelante, María. Sí. Muy buenos días. Mi nombre es Maribel Mireles. Llevo más de 10 años uh, involucrada en mi comunidad en el Distrito Escolar de Long Beach. Soy un líder de Latinos en Action California y tengo una hija que se graduó de Jordan High School en el 2015. Fue aprendiz de inglés y tengo un hijo en el cuarto grado que también es aprendiz de inglés, ambos en el distrito escolar de Long Beach. Este es un tema muy personal y en mi experiencia no soy la única como mamá con hijos de aprendices de inglés. Aunque mi hija asistió a la escuela del distrito de Long Beach desde kinder, ella nunca se reclasificó y nunca entendimos el por qué. En ese tiempo yo participaba activamente en la escuela. Fui representante de ILAC en Jordan. Aunque era mamá muy involucrada, no sabía qué preguntas hacer a sus maestros o sus consejeros sobre su reclasificación de mi hija y cómo apoyarla. Ella nunca reclasificó y tuvo un impacto negativo mientras que ella asistía a la escuela relacionado con bullying. Seis años han pasado desde que mi hija se graduó y no ha habido mucho cambio en el distrito escolar de Long Beach de cómo informar a los padres de familia sobre el proceso para re aprendices de inglés y lo importante de re reclasificar antes de la secundaria y el proceso para reclasificar. Um, mi segundo hijo, Taylor, está en, en cuarto grado y es también aprendiz de inglés. Cuando le pregunté a su consejera cómo va para reclasificar, me dijo que está cerca. ¿Pero qué significa eso? ¿Qué le falta? ¿Cómo lo estaban apoyando en la escuela? ¿Cómo podemos apoyar en casa? Necesitamos sesiones uno a uno entre padres y maestros o consejeros para leer el reporte del LCAP juntos, para identificar las áreas donde nuestros hijos son fuertes y donde necesitan ayuda. Esos detalles hacen una gran diferencia para saber qué preguntas hacer a sus maestros y cómo apoyar a nuestros hijos. Con el apoyo de Latinos en Action y grupos de mamás que apoyan afuera de la escuela, yo estoy aprendiendo cómo abogar por mi hijo para que así él reclasifique antes de pasar a la secundaria. Pero estas capacitaciones tienen que ser de la escuela 
y tienen que venir también del distrito para que más padres hagan lo, puedan hacer lo mismo que yo. Muchas gracias. Ah, buenos días, mi nombre ¿Cómo? es María Loesa, yo iba a dar mi testimonio, pido una disculpa, no puedo prender mi cámara por ¿Cómo? razones de salud, estoy en el hospital, tuve un accidente, pero cuando quise dar mi testimonio no me dejaron prender el micrófono y... Ah. Muchas gracias. Good morning, my name is Maria Loesa, and I was supposed to give my testimony. I'm not able to uh, turn on my camera because of health problems. I have been in the hospital, but uh, I'm here. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. And um, this is um, Maribel's testimony. It says, good morning. My name is Maribel Mireles. I have been involved in my community in the Long Beach School District for over 10 years. I am a leader in Latinos in Action, California. I have a daughter who graduated. Ari, Araceli, I, th I think we were going to put the, the English in the chat, if that's okay, because I think we're a little bit behind our schedule. We, we were seeing okay. oh, we were seeing her English on the screen, so we thought it was okay. okay. And Maria Loesa said somebody don't, uh, don't give permission to use the... Um, Micro, uh, microphone to, to make the testimony. The interpreter don't say everything. Thank you. Okay. And I think, the, well, I think we're ready, you know, I want to thank the parents. They practice, uh, and I know we were staying on time. I understand we are behind the program, but this is part of what exemplifies the challenges with mm -hmm. interpretation. Now, mm -hmm. Long Beach Unified is not the only district that experiences. So I would urge the district to look around for others as to how others are, are managing this because it mm -hmm. can be done better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Araceli, Maribel, and Maria. Um, just as you have all observed, these are some of the challenges that are um, Spanish, our, our non-English speaking families encounter when we are attempting to hold space for community input. Can someone drop the slide, please? So these are the type of the encounters. So um, again, thank you for the parents that participated this morning. And it requires us to do a little bit extra, a lot of, I'm not gonna say a little bit, a lot of bit extra to ensure that we're inclusive in hearing multiple voices. I mean, just how we had another parent do um, English translation or, or read English translation. Those are the type of efforts that we have to put in place to make sure that all voices are heard. Um, so at the end of this, at the end of our program, we will be having breakout rooms. We will have one that is dedicated to language access and English language learners. So there'll be an opportunity to give more input and more dialogue when we reach that uh, place and space. But I'm going to go ahead. We have our, our um, moderator waiting and our panel uh, waiting to, to move forward. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Alyssa forward. And to our pinners, can you please go ahead and get our pinner, um, our next people pinned, and that would be uh, Dr. Howard, Dr. Simon, Mariela Salgado, and Shayla Brown. And I'm passing it over to Alyssa. Thank you, Jolene. I am very excited about today's guest moderator and keynote speaker, Dr. Tyrone Howard, a dynamic educational thought leader. Dr. Tyrone Howard is a professor of education in the School of Education and Information Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. He is also the director of the UCLA Center for the Transformation of Schools. Professor Howard's research addresses issues tied to race, culture, access, and educational opportunities for minoritized student populations. Dr. Howard is the author of several best-selling books, including Why Race and Culture Matter in Schools, Closing the Achievement Gap in America's Classrooms. Dr. Howard is a native of Compton, California, where he, is all, he has also served as a classroom teacher. He is a member of the National Academy of Education and has been listed by Education Week as one of the 30 most influential education scholars in the nation on education practice, policy, and research. Please welcome Dr. Tyrone Howard. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I appreciate that warm introduction. It is truly my honor and privilege to be here with you all this morning for such an important topic. And I really want to applaud everyone who is here, who's taken time out of their schedules because we have to get this right. Uh, this is a, a really personal conversation for me today because I'm a 
a product of Compton, but I graduated from Long Beach Jordan High School. So I hold Long Beach near and dear to my heart, and I want to see Long Beach do it right. I want to see Long Beach be a model for the rest of not just only the state of California, but I love to see Long Beach be a model for the rest of the nation. So let us be clear. I think it goes without saying that COVID-19 has hit everyone in some kind of way. But if we're really going to have a real honest and courageous conversation today, which I have already heard we have been having, we must recognize, we must acknowledge that we know that Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Asian Pacific Islander communities have been especially hard between loss of life, loss of employment, displacement of living, family stressors, education instability, food insecurities, the list goes on and on. So as we think about coming back to schools, as our students are starting to become more and more acclimated in our school systems, we must be clear about one particular challenge. We must recognize the social, emotional health and well-being of our students must come before the academic emphasis. Let me say that again. We must be clear and we must prioritize the social, emotional health and well-being of our students before we place their academic concerns. In short, what I'm asking for us to do is to allow students to Maslow before they bloom, to Maslow before they bloom. For those who might not be familiar, Abraham Maslow wrote in 1943 that the fundamental aspect to learning is for students to have their most basic needs met, food, safety, shelter, security, protection, and that without those fundamental pieces being in place, you're going to have a hard time helping students reach their academic potential. So that's what today's conversation is about, social emotional learning. How do we help young people deal with depression, anxiety, uncertainty, fear, angst, and other host of kinds of social emotional challenges that plays a huge role to helping students thrive academically. So let us be clear, today is about not putting the cart before the horse, but about getting this right, to allow students to Maslow before they bloom. We have the good fortune today to have a phenomenal group of panelists who are going to help to talk to us about why we must prioritize social emotional learning, why it can't be looked at in this very sort of one size fits all approach, but how we have to look at the unique needs of particular communities. So I'd like to now turn it over to allow each of the panelists to introduce themselves and we will start the conversation. We'll start with Dr. Simon. All right, Dr. Howard, how are you? Thank you for being here today. And first of all, I am Aaron Simon, Assistant Superintendent of School Support Services uh, for the Long Beach Unified School District. Um, as always, it is a pleasure um, to be with you, um, parents, community members, key stakeholders, and also to converse with you. Um, I really just love having conversations just to glean perspectives um, and also understand, right, what our community values and what our community needs. So again, as always, it is a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Howard, good morning. My name is Mariana Salgado. I'm a Parks Commissioner for the City of Long Beach and a parent of two, a kindergartner and a second grader in LBUSD, and also a District Community Advisory Committee member. Good morning, I am Shayla Brown and I am a teacher here in Long Beach um, at an elementary school and I have a middle school and a high school student in Long Beach. Glad to have you all here. So we're going to jump right into it. I want to start off by um, asking, I'll start off with Assistant Superintendent uh, Simon. Do you think the current LCAP supports students and parents and caregivers social emotional needs? Dr. Howard, I, I believe there are components that do. And, you know, for us um, as a district, I um, mean, this is why we are gleaning the perspectives of key stakeholders. And when I say we, the district, um, I know specifically we have really identified um, an SEL, even advisory committee to even help us, right, compile and curate um, and understand what more of those SEL needs are. And not just with the SEL advisory committee, um, but also with our parent groups and also our student groups as well. We have been really engaging in deep conversations around that. And so we know that there's more that's needed. Um, I'm not ashamed to, to say that. There's some great things that we have done in this district, some good things, but we know that based on the current climate, as you mentioned, based on COVID that has um, exacerbated needs, um, there is more intentionality that we need to place um, around our SEO efforts and also around our SEO priorities. Thank you. Ms. Salgado, 
Is there anything that you would like to see in the LCAP plan that is not in place right now as it pertains to the social emotional well-being of our students? Absolutely. Um, I'm glad you talked about in your introduction about the basic needs of our child first. Um, one of the things that uh, has been a bit disheartening, I think, for many households, as you said, we're in the middle of a pandemic. You know, there, there are many households who are struggling. And I think one of the immediate things that this district can do is provide stipends for households that are not in person. Um, why make it difficult? As we always say, you know, meet people where they are. Um, so I think that's a best basic need that the district can cover and help support families. But one of the things for me personally is, as you saw earlier with our English learners, you know, having culturally sensitive or um, uh, supports that are in their language makes such a difference in terms of student engagement. And I think one of the things I, mi I say that's missing is sort of outreach coordinators or additional staff in each site that will allow to support, um, for example, um, at Edison Elementary, there's a role, community liaison a role that helps support parents and re-engage and, and, and impact chronic absenteeism. So I think one of the major things I see missing is the additional staff that we would like to see, to see at each school site, particularly those that have high need students, whether that is those with IEPs, English learners, um, our black students of Pacific Islands, which will be discussed, uh, those I think those their needs should be at the pri at the front forefront of the district. Thank you so important, Ms. Sargat. I want to come back to you on that because you raised some important points. Ms. Brown, what specific feedback would you offer to the district? Um, I would like to say I agree wholeheartedly with the idea of Maslow before Bloom. And I know that our district has, as um, Dr. Simon mentioned, has put some things in place that are making strides. We have um, an advisory committee in place to really study and and determine what to do, right, with this additional funding to support SEL for students. But I also think that, as you said, Dr. Howard, we need more intentionality. And as a district, I think that um, a lot of emphasis has been placed on interventions. Okay, we're going to do this reading intervention. We're going to do this math intervention. So far, there's no real plan yet for what the SEL intervention might look like. And I think that that all of our effort needs to be directed there. And um, the research is saying that the number one difference maker for kids is relationship with a trusted adult. And so all of the staff members on a school campus, you know, their, their responsibility out, like everybody is overwhelmed. They have so much happening. We need dedicated people on, on school campuses, on every school campus that their job is to make sure that students have relationship. Um, my role right now at my school is social emotional learning um, coach. And so that's my, that's my thing. I'm meeting with parents. I'm meeting with students. I'm having friendship groups. I'm working. So that's what I would like to see our district um, make available. There's plans now for something called care centers um, that will start to take place. And I, I would love to see those fully staffed. But as an additional thing, which I think is equally as important, is to support classroom teachers with knowing better how to develop those relationships. And of course, there's lots tucked into that in terms of um, bias, um, all out prejudice, um, racism. But I feel like we need a concerted effort to continually develop our teachers with um, having high quality relationships with students, ongoing, yeah. ongoing training. Yeah, Ms. Brown, you raised a number. Of, we could talk all day because you all are you're hitting on some really important points. Let me come back to Dr. Simon. So, Dr. Simon, um, there are people who are probably listening to us right now who still may think, well, that feels like a bunch of sort of, um, you know, soft skill stuff. Right. And we need to get kids back on track academically. We need to put interventions around reading and writing and math. And and that's the foundation. Why are not we talking more about that? And folks who don't always buy into or understand the importance of the social emotional learning piece. What would you say to those folks who might have such such opinions? Well, now, Dr. Har, you're speaking to my soul and my heart. Um, and this is something I know the district um, is looking around interventions, as you know, Sheila mentioned. And you know me, I'm, I'm that Maslow before Bloom kind of kind of speaker, kind of understander. 
And even for us, I, I want folks to understand if, if our students are not well, and let me just add this into the mix as well. If our adults are not well, if they are pouring from an empty cup, they are not going to be able to support our students and to educate them in the way that they need to be. So to Shayla's point, right, Ms. Brown's point, um, we've had many conversations, and I can also say that, you know, Ms. Brown is a part of our SEL advisory committee and for a reason, right, based on what she mentioned today. Um, we are really focusing around changing mindsets and building up those SEL competencies with our adults first, um, even before we hit hard with our students. Um, and also, although we're, we're, we're building that up as well, um, if we don't take care of the social emotional health, if we don't take care of the well-being of our students, then they're not going to be able to get to the academics um, and we're not going to be able to move the needle. And I can tell you just quick, because I can preach on this all day, um, as, as a person, and I, I don't say this just to say it, from South LA, who had so many mentors um, and people to help guide me um, to get to where I am today. They took care of my SEL. Right. They took care of my SEL so that I could thrive in the classroom and be a successful student. And that's something that we're taking pride in in the Long Beach Unified School District. And I'll be happy even to explain um, what those resources and interventions are regarding SEL um, that we have put in place and that we're going to continue um, to move forward with. Dr. Simon, you know, you have been uh, an, an ally of ours with UCLA as we've done some work around student homelessness. And, and your work has been critical there because I think we don't seem to recognize some of the real basic day-to-day -day needs that students are struggling and have met. And, and a student can't think about homework if they don't know where they're going to sleep at night. A student can't focus on assignment if they're not sure where their next meal is coming from. So truly been a champion in this work. And I just want to say thank you for being someone who pushed to the envelope and says the things that need to be say, said, even though folks may not want to hear. Thank you so much. I want to come back to Ms. Salgado, because you said something that was important earlier. You talked about the fact that you would love to see outreach coordinators and additional staff. And I think that that is important because there was a report that came out just a couple of days ago that showed that there's been a significant de decrease in the number of young people who've come back to school over the past couple of months. Families, for a variety of reasons, are not sending their children back to school. Some out of concerns for safety, some out of concerns for, you know, economic reasons, some out of concerns for child care purposes. Uh, what kinds of things could you see or would you like to see um, staff do as they try to get more par parents and caregivers to send their young people back to school? Because I think that's important to talk about the need for outreach coordinators. W why can they be important? How can it be important in this work? Well, I mean, you, you talked about kids missing, and I think it particularly is kids of color or those that were having a lot of trouble, technical issues. So I think I mean, it's logistically impossible to address the, I think last year there was about 7,000 students we lost touch with. It's, it's logistically impossible to get through them in one month. But I think the moment calls for adding and building capacity, whether it's getting curriculum or tools that can be used by the existing staff or adding additional staff. I know that as Ms. Brown said, you know, every role is being stretched to its, its thinnest. Well, there is a lot of money coming to the district, um, as Ms. Nicole said earlier. So that money can be used to meet the moment now by building capacity to do, do that work, you know, to support the family, the current infrastructure, for example, family resource centers, you know, they could have additional staff to support that work. Um, the school sites, whether it's, um, I think Ms. Brown is a SEL TOSA, th that is, she's, that school site is very fortunate to have that. What if every school site with those needs had a, a SEL TOSA or an extension of it. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to, at least for the short term, meet the need now. Powerful, powerful, powerful. That's a perfect segue. So Ms. Brown, you're an SEL TOSA. Talk about why SEL TOSA is important, what you do, why it matters, and why we need more of you in, in, in Long Beach. Well, <laughs> Um, my school, I wasn't at this particular school when the decision was made to create this position, but I think most of our schools are dealing with the same issues. We have um, students who are struggling. They they are acting out and pre in the before times, you know, getting sent to the office, um, constant suspension, just teachers having difficulty really knowing what to do. And so um, 
when an individual studies um, child psychology and behavior and what types of interventions work, a person has a particular level of expertise. And I think each each of us, if you remember, there was one teacher who didn't really have to try. She just knew how to get to you. Like she knew how to make that relationship work. You felt seen by that teacher. It's not magic. You know, some people it comes naturally to, but there there's a skill and an art to it that can be taught. So that I think is where the importance hits, where people who know how to build relationships can teach others how to do that. And so part of it is looking at the classroom teacher and how he or she helps to develop relationship with students. And part of it is working with kids, the ones who need the most support. Additionally, I also would like to say that um, part of my job this year is to work with teachers on their academic lessons because that's another layer. If I'm a child who already doesn't particularly want to be in school today and the lesson does not connect to me, there's nothing within that instruction that I can grab a hold to, then there's less of a chance that I'm going to focus. So part of my job is to talk with teachers, help them plan through what can we do with this lesson to make it more relevant to your students? What kind of skill set would your student need to be effective in this small group? How can you in, like insert particular and specific strategies and supports so that your child has high success. That's the other part of my job, which I think is important. And when we're thinking about intervention, we're talking about basic instruction, right? The instruction needs to hook the kid. The instruction needs to be relevant and important to the kid. And so that's the other part I believe that um, is critical for the right now, as um, Ms. Mar Mariella said, to meet the moment, but going forward as well, the instruction needs to be relevant and related to kids. And that's a, another part of, of what I'm doing. Love it, love it. Related, rigorous connections. Alyssa, I know you're there. We've got another panel. Can I ask one more question to each of the panelists real quick? I just don't want to let them go. I think they're dropping so many pearls here. So if I can just- I'm out of time. Oh my goodness. Come on now. I guess I got to cut it short because I could talk to this group all day because this is a topic I think we don't spend nearly as much time on. And I'm so glad to see that you all are uplifting it and talking about it. So um, I'm going to be the the um, the respectful uh, uh, moderator here and, and listen to the folks who are in charge here. But I want to thank uh, Dr. Simon. I want to thank uh, Mariela Salgado, and I want to thank Ms. Shayla Brown for the work that you are doing, lifting up social emotional learning, lifting up the needs of our students holistically to make sure that they can Maslow before they bloom. I think that's so important. I appreciate you all being on board with that. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all for a, a very essential and engaging conversation around social emotional learning. As most of you know, this is a subject that's very close to my heart and soul as well. And I could listen to this all day, but we're being told that we need to transition. So there were there are some slides prepared, were prepared for the SEL um, panel and they will be available later. We are gonna tradition, transition, excuse me, to a conversation about student achievement, black and Pacific Islander student achievement, another very essential um, important conversation. So again, thank you, Alyssa. Let me be clear. Um, part of the job, part of the work, part of the need in this moment is for us to have some courageous conversations about topics that are not always easy to discuss. But this is the moment that we must be better. This is the moment we have to be bolder. This is the moment where we have to be brave to have conversations pertaining to race. And in particular, within the context of Long Beach Unified Schools, Black and Pacific Islander students. Uh, I could probably spend the next hour going through a litany of data that shows that we have to do a better job supporting and serving Black and Pacific Islander students. But instead of doing that, we're going to have our next panelist speak specifically to that. So I want to now turn it over to each of our panelists, and I will allow them to introduce themselves before I move into questions. So the first person who popped up was uh, Dr. Lund, so you can take it first, please. Thank you. And I'm sorry um, to jump in just real quick. Could we uh, start sharing the slides again? And just wanted to also alert folks that there's a link in the chat for Padlet, which is an opportunity for you to give your feedback on some of these topics. So please um, click on that link and enter any feedback you have. Thank you. Good morning, Dr. Howard, and good morning to all of our parents and community members that are joining us this morning. 
Muy buenos días a todos los padres que están aquí con nosotros esta mañana y los miembros de la comunidad que están aquí participando con nosotros. Uh, my name is Dr. Christopher Lund. I'm the assistant superintendent of middle and K-8 schools. I also spent a number of years as the uh, assistant superintendent of research for our district. Um, I'm here to share, obviously, our intervention work this year and our plans for next year, uh, recognizing that you know, we've got some, I think, pretty uh, innovative ideas around better supporting our students for next year, but also obviously as a listener to hear I additional ideas on what we can do better to better support our Black, African-American, uh, Pacific Islander students in particular. I think it's an opportunity, Dr. Howard, also to build on what the conversation that just happened, you know, that the academic work doesn't happen without the SEL work. Uh, the work that Shayla Brown was just talking about in terms of building that culture in the classroom, um, around effective first teaching predicated upon a culture in the classroom that supports students through effective relationships and restorative practices uh, is essential to supporting learning. So we can, I think, uh, continue to build on that uh, conversation as well. And I'd also like just to share a quick celebration around our reopening of our middle and high schools this week. So we welcomed back uh, over 7,000 middle school students um, this week, we're welcoming back a total of over 8,000 high school students. Uh, and we're also continuing to support our almost 19,000 students that are continuing their learning online. So it's just a, it's a big celebration within our system and just an acknowledgement of all the hard work that our teachers and staff have uh, put forth to really make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I'm going to say Miss Coleman. I do not want to butcher your name, but I'm going to let you say your name properly so and you can introduce yourself. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we would like to um, welcome you in my native tongue. Welcome. My name is Malaya Fipule Aitomalatai Coleman. Um, I'm a founder of the Pacific Island Education Voyage. I'm a CAMS parent, family for classes of 2001, 2002, 2004, 2011, 2012, 2015, 2017, and 2019. Welcome. Thank you so much. Look forward to hearing from you. Next up, uh, Dr. Tabari. Hi again, good after, was it afternoon yet? No, we're still on 11 o'clock. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing the presentation slides though we got a little bit ahead of ourselves there and digging into this conversation. I am Dr. Tabari. I'm a parent in the district and part of the Local Control Accountability Plan, LCAP Parent Committee. I'm also a member of Black Lives Matter Long Beach and very committed to the success of our Black students who are suffering academically in the district. Similarly, I am committed to the success of Black folks in Long Beach who are negatively impacted by racism in all areas of their lives. Back to you, Dr. Howard. All right, let's get into it. So, Dr. Lund, let's talk about it. Uh, this LCAP plan, how does it specifically and uniquely and pointedly address the needs of, of Black and uh, API students? Yeah, and Dr. So, Lund, can we throw up the slides for you to walk through? Yeah, I, I, I prefer to talk in, in generality around you know our work and i think we can call out specific aspects that are within the lpac as it relates to that um but if you want to pull those up please do so so when i think about our work as it relates to supporting uh african-american and pacific islander students in particular i kind of i put that work into our sort of uh mtss or rti model around you know tier one tier two and tier three sort of work you know, so what is that work, as I think Shayla Brown had alluded to, around how do we improve good first teaching in the classroom and the supports in doing so, uh, building a culture in the classroom that supports that work, the tier two sort of strategic intervention work, you know, the after school tutoring, the um, Saturday school programs, the pull out work with uh, TOSAs or teachers on special assignment, the push in work in the classrooms, the use of uh, teacher assistance to support students. And then that really more intensive tier three sort of work on really addressing the needs of our most uh, needy students in terms of one-on-one -on -one support, small group work, either in or outside of the classroom, 
um, pulling in outside resources to support students and families, really looking at a whole system of support for students. So just to kind of call out some starting points, you know, we have over 700 documented interventions that occurred this year. Uh, these interventions obviously included a wide range of, of tutoring interventions and Saturday school interventions. Uh, our Black Pacific Islander students were had a greater represent, representation in those interventions. Uh, so if they are being our more uh, needy groups of students in terms of academic needs, as well as perhaps other social emotional attendance needs, they do represent a greater portion of the interventions that were uh, were rolled out this year. Those interventions, uh, most of those interventions were academic in nature, supporting reading, writing, math, um, grad requirements, grades and such. Uh, but there are additional interventions around attendance um, and social emotional learning support. For next year, we have some uh, really robust interventions planned. We're rolling out over 100 literacy teachers across our elementary grades, supporting students in kinder through third grade. We are bringing in intervention coordinators. So similar to what Shayla talked about in terms of really working with teachers on classroom instruction, but also supporting interventions throughout the system. Uh, and we're putting an intervention coordinator into every one of our elementary uh, K-8 and middle schools. Uh, we have some exciting high school programs that are being rolled out this year and next year th through the use of student tutors. You know, students supporting students in the work, which I think is really uh, crucial in terms of building leadership, but also, you know, supporting our students um, with students that can uh, relate to them and support them most effectively. We're expanding our urban math collaborative, which was specifically designed to support our black, black African American students. Uh, so an expansion of that program, as well as continued credit recovery courses um, through independent study and additional means. Uh, obviously the care center work going on at our high schools, the expansion of our male and female leadership academies. Uh, and then obviously looking forward to summer school as well for this, this coming summer and how we can uh, help mitigate that learning loss um, that's, that our students have experienced this year. Okay. Ms. Coleman, you heard Dr. Lung. What would you say you would like to see this LCAP do specifically as it pertains to the needs of uh, Pacific Islander students? Well, um, thank you, Dr. Lung. I would like to see the growth, academic growth, as they call it. I, there's a proposition in threefold. Um, that means is they need to have a TOLA pilot uh, program. Can you please, uh, Maria, can you mute your, mute your computer, please? Can we, can we please mute Maria? I don't know that. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Coleman, go ahead. Uh, that's okay. Um, the program for the, to help the Pacific Islander, they call TOLA, Teeth One Lesson Ahead Pilot Program, target traditionally difficult classes, similar to supplementary, uh, uh, supplemental uh, instruction where students attend a group uh, tutorial space to review where learners earlier that day, week with the follow peers and a personal staff member of or SI leader. Tala flips the order and hosts the group tutoring space to review lessons before the teacher re reaches the top topic. With the additional uh, support ahead in, uh, instead of after uh, classroom instruction, students will feel more confident in a, in a classroom, which first leads, leads to feeling empowered to ask questions, second, participate in more classroom discussions, activities, and third, take a more proactive rather than reactive uh, approach. The taller leader would work closely with instructors to make sure their lessons plans are aligned and relevant to follow of the class. We purpose, uh, the, we, per, we propose a, a, uh, a portion of the budget to allocate TOLA pilot program, hire TOLA leaders, and provide any instructional materials or equipment to facilitate instruction. Personal growth, community involvement. We need to hire more Pacific Islander staff counselors and teachers. They can relate to the students and parents and their culture and language in their voyage for success. We need to provide 
parent involvement events specifically for Pacific Islanders, students and parents to celebrate their culture and history. We also need to include Pacific Islander culture and history in the school curriculum, provide tutorial that it will, it will help uh, to have the uh, parent involvement, align with the district, implementation of restoration justice uh, practice. We propose hiring members for surrounding communities of the school to serve as after school aides. Campus respond, uh, response members and teachers. Representation matters. Many students go through the entire K through 12 experience without even seeing a Pacific Islander instruction, an instructor. Hire community members to teach students about culture, Long Beach history, how to get politically involved, addressing systematic barriers and more. Teachers and, inst and instructors are already underpaid without new expectation to include the heavy topics within the curriculum. By hiring community members for those roles, it is, it can support the district's goal and eliminate the need for campus policing, which is also problematic. Third, professional growth, honor their hostel, prepare students for whatever the post high school plans are. Do not persuade them at one way from another. Teach students to talk about how resilient they are from trails and tribulations rather than feel they need to trade a, a traumatic story for a scholarship. For many, they may be, they may be the first in their families to be in these very seats and, um, creating language from the experience can be difficult, but we can yes. support them with that. Thank you, Ms. Coleman. I could hear you talk all day. I want to make sure we got limited time and I want to come. I want to make sure I give some time to Dr. Tabari and I want to come back to you. But thank you. So hold your hold your thought of where you are, because we want to hear more powerful, powerful recommendations you offer. Dr. Tabar Tabari, let's shift. I want to ask the same question to you about what you would like to see in this LCAP as it pertains to the unique needs of black students in Long Beach. Thank you. Thank you, Malaya, for all the, I want to say ditto for Black students to everything that you said. And we were sharing some slides earlier, right, um, as, as Dr. Lund was talking, and you could have an idea of the percentage of high schoolers that are, um, that are not on track to graduation, how if we disaggregate that data, you know, Black and Pacific Islander students are at the bottom. Um, you know, I, I think it's something like 57% of Black students are getting Bs and Fs, 56% of, you know, Pacific Islander students, which is why Malai and I are in this conversation together. So for me, what is missing from the LCAP is there's not, a, it's pretty general, first of all, right? It's like a, it's like an ice cream sundae. You just throw everything in there, you know, swirl it up and call it a sundae. This is not what we want, right? If we're, if we're talking about equity and excellence, this is not equitable, right? We want to see some specificity. We want to see some concrete metrics and programs to support high academic learning and positive cultural identity for Black and Pacific Islander students. We want the specificity. There are other districts that are doing this, right? There are other LCAPs that are clearly delineating things that are going to target African-American students, things that will target Pacific Islander students. Yes. So there's no reason why we need to Sunday this up in this, in this situation, right? We want, we want some clarity on how high need students will be identified and targeted. We want to know how technology infrastructure, you know, is better able to help schools provide the necessary support. So there's a lot of specific, um, goals and metrics that were shared from this from the LCAP parent group that I'm a part of. You know, we set some pretty specific goals, some pretty specific measurements, some pretty specific metrics for the LCAP. And we didn't see a lot of that in this draft LCAP. So we would really like folks to go back to the drawing board and, and make us visible. Right now, Black and Pacific Islanders are invisible. And that is not okay. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Tabari. So I'm going to come back to you, Dr. Lum, because you had two really poignant and very specific sort of reactions to where concerned uh, parents and educators feel like it's not enough. 
that to have this one size fits all approach, to have a more generic kind of a sort of a framing that kind of is sort of under this sort of MTSS approach, doesn't get to the unique and specific needs of black and PI students, doesn't sort of explicitly state what kinds of agendas or what kinds of learning initiative, what kinds of supports will be targeted uniquely for them. How would you respond to folks who have similar concerns? Because I'm sure they're not the only ones who have these feelings. They're probably not the only ones who feel like there's not enough being done. What would you say? First, I really appreciate the suggestions and ideas that were shared. I fully agree um, with the ideas um, that were shared by both Dr. Tabari and with by Ms. Coleman. The the work I look at this as a, a multifaceted sort of approach of really uh, looking at how across our entire system we can obviously address the equity work um, that's first and foremost in our agenda for next year, the professional development that needs to be provided to teachers around SEL and equity and supporting English learners, the uh, revised curriculum. So we're going through a curriculum audit right now so that we wanna make sure that our curriculum in particular, that as Ms. Coleman alluded to, reflects our students, um, what we're referring to as you know uh, windows and mirrors for students mirrors to see themselves in their curriculum, uh, windows to see and learn from other cultures within the curriculum, um, and access as a sliding door uh, to that work. The HR, HR department is really working on diversifying our workforce so that students do see themselves in our teaching force, and I think that's really important. Uh, the pre-teaching that Ms. Coleman alluded to, on uh, the expansion of sort of building out that sort of pre-teaching experience at the middle school level, we're looking at a, a full expansion of our zero period courses. So we've been pushing more and more students into accelerated courses to really raise the bar in terms of our expectations and for student access into high school ready courses and then college ready courses. But that has to come with support as well. So if you're going to push a student into an accelerated math program, it's providing that additional support with them to make sure that they're not um, sinking within that program. So that sort of zero period intervention that we're planning, I love the idea of using that as a pre-teaching opportunity for what the students are gonna see later in the day in their math course. So really thank you for that suggestion. Lots of work to do, lots of work to do, lots of work to do. I'm being sensitive to the time. I, I've got lots more questions, but I'm being sort of um, um, mindful of the fact that we're a little bit over our time, but I want to I want to encourage both Dr. Tabari as well as Ms. Coleman to continue to be leaders and to be out front and to be vocal and to be very much persistent in addressing the needs for PI and for Black students because uh, we cannot say that we are going to be uh, a world class district in Long Beach if we see subgroups that are not meeting the kinds of standards of, of educational excellence that we know that they're capable of reaching. We cannot say that we are going to be a shiny district. Uh, in LA County if we continue to see some of the data coming out. So I just want to say thank you all. Dr. Uh, Howard, before you before you close, I just want to say one quick thing because I, yeah. I believe in leaving us with an action plan at the end of a conversation. And okay. I want to say this action plan for parents and, and mm -hmm. guardians and community members listening. You have a role in this too, right? Mm -hmm. Email your public comments to the Board of Ed. Email Superintendent Dr. Jill Baker. Attend mm -hmm. your local PTAs, your school site councils, your affinity group, their Black parent group meetings, their Pacific Islander parent group meetings, their Latinx parent group meetings. There are things that you can do as a parent and guardian. This is not all up to the district. These are our children. These are our babies. We have power. We have agency. There are things we can do. Don't leave it all up to Dr. Lund. He's not going to figure it all out, right? Or Dr. Right. Simon or Dr. Baker. We all need to be in this together. So I just wanted to make that call to action before I leave. I, Thank I you, just want to add what, what uh, Kim was saying is what my mother always say that we are the heart and children are the heartbeat. Mm. As long as you mm -hmm. have that concept and Beautiful. that oils from uh, the, the Board of Education to the teachers to the students, that is so significant. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Alyssa, did we not go too far off, off, off our schedule? If we did, I take responsibility because I couldn't stop those powerhouses from sharing that information. You know, Dr. Howard, you have certain liberties that we're going to allow. <laughs> but I think Nicola has an announcement for us about Padlet. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Howard, and to all of our panelists. I just wanted to let everyone else know that there are opportunities to provide your feedback 
using this Padlet sort of system. I'm going to share my screen really quick. I think some of you are already in here, but if you're not, um, please click, click the link that Michael will be dropping in the chat. We have boards for social emotional learning, English language learners and language access, and Black and Pacific Islander student achievement, as well as any overall LCAP feedback um, if it doesn't fit into one of those categories. So please drop your comments, your questions, your feedback, your experiences in the, the right board. And um, that will really help, I think, the district to make a plan that's more responsive to your experiences and needs. Thank you. So well, thank you to everyone for that insightful, impactful, and it's essential conversation around social emotional learning and Black and Pacific Islander student achievement. This is a conversation that must continue. So we're in for a special treat. I told you guys we were. We're going to welcome back Dr. Tyrone Howard, UCLA, UCLA professor, best-selling author, and educational leader, and a graduate of Long Beach, Jordan. I didn't know that, Dr. Howard. Look at that. So thank you. Get ready. And Dr. Howard, please join us. Thank you so much. Um, this was a rich conversation. And I want to say that before... Um, I heard the the panelists. I had a PowerPoint plan. I'm going to walk through some data, but I think I'm going to do something different. I think I'm going to use the brief time I have with you to really speak from my heart. And I'm going to speak to you from my heart because these issues are really heart issues, H-E-A-R-T, heart issues. Uh, I think about the fact when I was a young boy, my father would always push me to be better. He would tell me, you're good, but you can be so much better. So I can recall many a mornings, he would wake me and my brother up and on Saturday, Sunday mornings, we have to wake up and we have to go out and cut grass and, and go cut Mrs. Brown's grass and go cut Mr. Williams' grass and we had to rake leaves and we had to do all this work around the yard and we had to uh, cycle cans and I hated it, right? I hated it, but he would always say, because I'm pushing you to be better. And when you're young, you don't realize when somebody sees something in you that you don't see in yourself. And we would mutter things under our breath, my brother and I, because we hated getting up early in the morning. We hated doing all this dirty work. But my dad was pushing us to be better. He said, don't settle on being good. Strive for being great. And now that I look back, I'm so grateful that he said things that I didn't want to hear, but I needed to hear. He did things that I didn't want him to do, but he needed to do. And he was the person who saw something in me that I did not see in myself. And so I'm forever grateful for him pushing me to go from good to great. I use that analogy because I want to challenge you, Long Beach Unified School District. You have gotten a lot of different accolades over the last decade. You have been recognized as uh, an exemplary district. And the urban superintendents have, have looked at you as a model. I've spoken you up as a model. But I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you to go from good to great. And that's a big jump to make, to go from being good to being great. Because if you want to go from being good to being great, you've got to be willing to have some hard, hard conversations. You've got to be willing to take some very uncomfortable stance. You've got to be willing to do the things that folks may frown about, but you believe it's the right thing to do if you want to be great. Because see, what you have to remember, Long Beach, is that being great is about not serving some of your students. Being great is not about serving most of your students. Being great is about serving all of your students. And part of what going from good to great means is that we have to have hard conversations about who are the students that we're leaving behind every single year, despite the fact that we know that they have some severe and serious needs. But again, I'm not going to put this on where the students are falling short. This conversation with you this morning is not about what's wrong with the students. This is a hard conversation, Long Beach. It's about what's wrong with our schools and the people in them in terms of how they can serve our students better. We're going to flip this conversation. And like I said, this is the conversation that we have to have if we're going to go from being good to being great. we got to hear some things we don't want to hear. we got to do some things that we haven't done. But if the goal is to be great, we have to be willing to understand that this is not about being personal. It's about what we have to do to get to where we need to be. I'm oftentimes reminded of Dr. King's 1963 talk when he says that we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. He says we are confronted with what he called the fierce urgency of now, the fierce urgency of now. And he said in this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there's no such thing as being too late. He said this is no time for apathy or complacency. 
He said, this is a time for vigorous and positive action. So I think Dr. King's words really are poignant and relevant in this moment because there's a fierce urgency of now that we have to take on Long Beach if we're going to do this work the right way. You've heard it. We have this real unique opportunity. There are about to be millions of dollars. Let me say that again. Millions of dollars that are coming into the district, right? Tens of millions. Some dear, some have even put estimates as hundreds of millions. I don't know the figure, but there are going to be millions of dollars. We have this rare opportunity to kind of put money into an LCAP plan that focuses on communities having more local control and making it easier to respond to the needs of students. And money matters. Let me be clear. Money is important. Uh, money can help us to move the needle to go from being good to being great. But I want us to think about how we can reimagine schools in a way that's going to be radically different that serves, again, not some students, not most students, but all students. So if we're going to do that within the context of the fierce urgency of now, recognizing the fact that tomorrow is today, then we have to have hard conversations. And reimagining schools, I think, is going to require us to have hard conversations in two particular areas. And we've spoken about both of them this morning. Let's, let's, let's talk first about social, emotional learning and well-being. We can't go from good to great unless we really have a hard conversation in this country and in this county and in Long Beach about mental health. Historically speaking, we don't like to address mental health. We don't like to talk mental health. We don't like to really get to the heart of mental health because we have unfortunately had this very, I think, just backwards way of saying mental health is something that's wrong with you. That saying you have mental health challenges just makes you weak. That saying the mental mental health challenges makes you somehow inadequate. We've got to stop that. We have to start having hard conversations about the fact that mental health matters matter. Mental health issues are important to all of us. And schools should be the laboratory that says we're going to destigmatize mental health. We're going to talk about it. We're going to normalize it. We're going to say it's okay to say we're not okay. I raise that because in this moment, what we have seen is our young people have been disconnected from their peers. Our young people have been disconnected from their social relationships. Our young people have been disconnected from their teachers and counselors, the people who really play a big role in their overall well-being. The number of young people who have suffered from anxiety and social isolation and loneliness and depression has been deeply, deeply troubling. Now is the time in this fierce urgency of now to make sure that we have mental health supports in all of our schools social workers in all of our schools, counselors in all of our schools, because students are going to come back to school with some different needs than what they had when we saw them over a year ago. We have to recognize that when you have issues around uncertainty, issues around displacement, issues around family challenges, that our young people are going to feel the effects of those moments. Mental health issues have to be a priority. I think we've done a piss poor job. I'll just say it, a piss poor job in this state of California of prioritizing mental health supports. We just have not put the priority in schools. And therefore, guess who becomes the new mental health workers? Teachers, counselors, administrators. I maintain in this moment of this fierce urgency of now, we have to make mental health issues a big, big focus of what we do because, and I'll say this, we have seen a significant increase in suicide amongst young people in our country during COVID. We have seen a significant increase of four groups, our young men and boys, because we have toxic masculinity that reigns supreme that doesn't tell our young boys it's okay to say I need help and I'm hurting. Our young boys are struggling in this moment. We've also seen a significant increase in suicide among our LGBTQ plus youth because we know the levels of homophobia and transphobia are real and from, our, our, from many of our young people, homes, unfortunately, is not the most supportive place. Schools are not the best, the most supportive spaces. And oh, by the way, we've also seen significant increases in suicide in our Black and Latinx communities. Because in many of our Black and Latinx communities, we don't talk about mental health. So we got to make mental health a real priority and talk about it and make it a real priority. That's issue number one. If we're going to reimagine schools in the fierce urgency of now, I'm also asking us to have this real hard conversation about the role of race and racism in our schools. What you cannot do, Long Beach, is sit and say we're all in on the conversation about mental health. But now, you know what? I don't want to talk about racism. Can't do that, folks. Can't do it. Because for some of our young people, the kinds of mental health challenges that they face in schools are a direct result of racism that they encounter in schools and classrooms. So you can't tap out once we start talking race. And there's some folks who are thinking, OK, Dr. Howard, I was with you when you were talking about mental health. And I'm going to lose you now on this issues around race. Can't do that. You can't tap out when we talk about racism, because if you choose to tap out, that means you have a privilege that many folks do not have. Right. Folks of color cannot tap out when it comes to issues of race and racism. And I tell folks, if you are uncomfortable 
and just sitting in a conversation around racism, if you're uncomfortable and uneasy, what do you think children of color feel every single day when they sit in learning spaces and they feel uncomfortable? So we got to start having some courageous conversation about how we're supporting the needs of black and PI students. I can go through all kinds of data. It's not good, Long Beach. We have to be better. So this is where we cannot make this mistake to say this is about money. I think this is about heart and minds, hearts and minds, beliefs and attitudes about what we fundamentally think about black and PI students. So we have to recognize that when we look at the data across the board, the black and PI students are not doing nearly as good as they should be. And we're not going to say what's wrong with them. We're not going to say, how do we fix them? We have to have a hard question in Long Beach. How do we fix the schools? How do we fix the supports that are supposed to serve them? See, the children are bright. The children are brilliant. The children are full of genius. They bring their best selves to school every single day. The question is, do we allow that genius to manifest? So as you start leading these conversations, Long Beach, understand there is going to be intense resistance because there are folks who just do not want to have these conversations. And you cannot let that resistance be the reason why you don't push forward to have these conversations, because, yes, issues of racism are real in our schools. But let me be clear here, and I may ruffle some feathers with this, but that's OK, because this is not about being popular or being expedient. It's about saying and doing what's right. When we talk about racism, I'm not talking about these kinds of <clears throat> blatant in your face explicit forms of racism i'm talking about what's called everyday acts of racism in the form of racial microaggressions right everyday forms of racism and forms of racial microaggressions right not giving black and pi students the opportunity to be in gifted and talented classes right the over policing and surveilling of black and pi students telling black and pi students that we don't think that they can take ap and honors class because they're not quite prepared for them Telling black and PI students that we don't think that they're college ready, that they should think about something that's more vocational. All these comments that many of our black and PI students can tell you about, that's the conversation we have to have, about how we have to start calling issues of racism on the carpet. We must start having conversations with teachers, administrators, and staff who are oftentimes complicit in this. And I will say this, it's not just me, Tyrone Howard, talking about white teachers doing this to kids of color. Please let me be clear, racism, Racism is not only enacted by white people. People of color are equally as complicit and oftentimes participatory in the dismissing of black and brown children. So we're talking about a mindset here that has to be had. We have to start talking about conversations about race. We have to make sure our LCAP has a focus on implicit bias training. We have to make sure that our LCAP plan says that we're going to make sure that we're looking at this aggregated data and say, why is it that black children are only 12% of the district, but they're like 35% of the kids get suspended or expelled from Long Beach. That is not acceptable, right? We have to ask why we don't have more PI teachers and counselors and, and language in, 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 in our classrooms and our schools in, in Long Beach. Again, going from good to great is not an easy thing. But we have to look at our curriculum and say, why don't we talk about Black Lives Matter? We have to say, why don't we see more black and brown teachers in our schools? We have to talk about how do we have more mandatory, transformative and, and more mandatory kinds of uh, a restorative justice approaches as opposed to pushing our children into the school to prison pipeline. So I'm asking us, Long Beach, if we're really ready to go from good to great, we got to start hard conversations. We got to start making sure that folks feel very uncomfortable, get comfortable feeling uncomfortable, the adults, right? And I'm also going to say this because parents, you have a role in this too. Parents, these are our children. These are our babies. We do not get a redo with this. We get one chance to get this right when it comes to K-12 education. So you've got to make sure that you are holding your school officials accountable. you got to show up at school board meetings. you got to be in communication with principals and teachers. And you also have to create the kind of loving ecosystem in your respective homes that says we're going to uphold excellence. We're going to make sure that we never settle for mediocrity for our young people. We're never going to settle for our young people just being good, but we're going to challenge them to be great. So we all have work to do, right? Parents, we are our children's first teachers. We set the foundation, we set the expectations, and we provide the, the, the support to say, you will be great. But at the same time, we have to make sure when we let our babies go and we send our babies to schools, that schools have the same kind of expectations and beliefs in them as we do as parents. So we all got some work to do, folks. And this is not about being popular. This is not always easy work. It's the right thing to do. Long Beach Unified School District, my high school that I'm a proud alum of, I don't want us to be average. I don't want us to be good. I think we've got the potential to be great.
And if we are going to settle for anything less than great, then shame on us. So I think the time is now to roll up our sleeves and get to work and start having the hard conversations and doing the necessary work to make our children our number one priority. Thank you so much. I'm so glad and honored to be in your presence this morning. And I will stop right there and see if we have a little bit of time for questions and answers. Can we please pull forward our question asker? So that's gonna be Angie. I'm here. Hello, thank you, Dr. Howard. Um, Alyssa was right. Um, just what a rich discussion um, that you have helped foster today, which has always been the goal of these forums to have dialogue. Um, there is what, my name is Angie Salazar. I'm with the Children's Defense Fund, part of the planning team. Um, so I just want to remind um, everyone, all the participants, that if you have questions, you can put them in the Zoom chat and you can also uh, put them in the Google form um, that's linked in the Zoom chat. Uh, but we'll start with this one question that I see here, which is, what are one time investments in your experience that have had long term impacts on SEL? The district will have close to four hundred million dollars, yet the LCAP does not include added SEL support staff. Yeah, so thank you, Angie. I think number one, the one-time impact is getting people into all schools who are trained and who are equipped with how to deal with mental health challenges. That means, as I mentioned a moment ago, we have social workers, we have psychologists, we have therapists in all schools. And for those schools that have an incredibly high need population, we even put additional resources there, right? Because we can't use this equality approach. Let's give everybody the same thing. This has got to be about equity, where equity says we're going to be unapologetically bold to say we're going to give more of our resources to the areas that have the greater needs. So if there are schools that we know of in Long Beach where students face high rates of, of anxiety, high rates of poverty, high rates of exclusion, then instead of putting just the same number of kinds of support persons in those schools that we put in other schools, we may have to double, triple, quadruple down on our resources in those schools to make sure that those teachers who are oftentimes overworked and overwhelmed have some additional supports. Because if we don't, here's what's going to happen, Angie. If we don't, we oftentimes misunderstand and misread students who are going through many social emotional challenges to be bad behavior. And then we begin to push those students out and we begin to label those students as being problematic. And the very students who are quote unquote the most difficult sometimes are going through the most difficult circumstances. Instead of pushing them away, we need to bring them to us and give them the appropriate supports and assistance that they need. Speaking my language, Dr. Howard, can I ask a uh, follow-up more specifically? I'm hearing you say more adults in, in the schools. Can you specify the type of support staff um, that you're, you're thinking about? And then there's another question about um, the role of counselors. What should be the main priority for school counselors in our schools? So to the extent that that's related to. Yeah, let me be clear about counselors because I think that can be a broad term. I'm not talking about just academic counselors, right? I'm talking about counselors who have a skill set around therapy and around meeting with students individually to help them process some of their challenges that they're going through. That's the kind of counseling I'm talking about. We're also talking about TOSAs, right? Teaching on special assignment who can be really uh, helpful here too. And let me also shout out another crew that another part of our, our, our ecosystem that we don't talk about as much, but our, and I don't know, our paraprofessionals, Instruction, our, our instructional aids are huge in this process. Why? Because oftentimes that's where we see more of our diversity with our, our support, our support staff, our instructional aides, our peer professionals. And these are the individuals who can serve as the cultural brokers. Many times these individuals know the families. They're familiar with the culture. They have the language consistency and they're able to kind of help connect and build those relationships with students in ways that sometimes our teachers cannot. So I think our aides, our paraprofessionals also need to be intensified. The more adults we have in schools, the more our students can be connected to. Thank you. Uh, here's another question about um, children with special needs. How are these issues compounded uh, for, for our, our students with disabilities? 
Yeah, we know. And look, there's a lot of data on this, that our students with disabilities have been some of the, along with language learners, have been some of the students who really struggled the most over the last 14 months. Uh, for a lot of our students who have anywhere from mild, moderate to severe needs, uh, their lack of access to the kind of supports that schools provide has been basically sort of, you know, really sort of gaping holes that they've had. So now we're going to have to try to take more time to make sure we help catch those students with special needs up, uh, whether it's learning disabilities, whether it's social emotional challenges, uh, whatever those needs might be of kids on the spectrum. We have to recognize that our, our students who have special needs rely in a really important way from the supports that they receive from school staff. School staff who are trained, school staff who have the patience, who have the know-how and the ability to help young people develop the kind of coping mechanisms behaviorally and academically that helps them to become successful. So I think in the LCAP, we need to make sure that we are calling out and lifting up our students with disabilities, as well as our language learners, because those are two groups who struggled mightily during this, this time that we were not in person for instruction. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Keep those questions coming um, if you have them. Uh, do a quick time check, uh, Jerlene. And make sure that we are calling out and lifting are. Up students with disabilities. Sorry about that. Thanks for muting yourself. So, um, we, ha we are good on time. We have time for about six more minutes worth of questions if people have questions. So you can either put the questions in the chat um, or you can put the questions in a Google link that should be in the chat. Great. Um, here's a question, uh, Dr. Howard. Um, given your expertise and research on uh, investments um, here in California, you know, outside of California, that have been effective in serving Black Pacific Islander students, and then you also mentioned uh, students with special needs and English learners. Uh, do you have um, I, you know, any that you can share with us these concrete um, either policy or practice changes uh, or or programs? Sure. So I'm a former classroom teacher. And the first panel, I think Ms. Brown was spot on. Right. And here's what we know. And there's all kind of data that backs this up. One of the most powerful practices to help improve students connectedness to schools and ultimately their effort and outcomes are relationships. Relationships matter, relationships matter, relationships matter. But they're just not these sort of hokey type of relationships. I'm talking about real sort of sustaining, culturally relevant, linguistically compatible kinds of relationships that are built upon trust, transparency, um, reciprocity, and also these relationships that are equipped with what we call warm demanders. Warm demanders are these adults who don't just tell kids what they think they want to hear. Don't just let kids do what they want to do. But warm demanders have these high expectations for students, believe in them to the utmost, but will challenge and push and hold students accountable to be the best that they can be. Warm demanders within the context of relationships are so vital. You show me students who are having a difficult time doing well in school, in all likelihood, you're going to show me students who don't have very many viable relationship with, with adults in the school. Show me the students who are thriving in the school. You're probably going to show me students who have lots of connections and lots of relationships with lots of adults in the school. Relationships matter. From a programmatic standpoint or a policy standpoint, here's what we know. We just released a report with the Center for the Transformation of Schools at UCLA that I direct. And what we talked about was digging deeper, looking beyond the schoolhouse. And what we found in that report is that what we see in lots of our communities, black and brown communities face some significant challenges before they even step foot in our schools. What am I talking about? We see that where black and, and brown children live in, in parts of Long Beach and other parts of the South Bay, the, the environmental kinds of pollutants, the groundwater pollution that are, that our children are breathing in lead to higher rates of asthma, lead to, lead to low birth weights, lead to all kinds of physiological conditions and challenges that our students face before they even step foot into our schools. So we have to put pressure on our elected officials to make sure we clean up some of the toxic landfills that are within walking, uh, within, well, within feet of our, some of our school sites, the, the, the toxic air our kids are bringing in. So we look at, the asthma rates, which lead to chronic absenteeism, we see, okay, our kids are missing school because they're sick and don't have access to, to the kind of medical supports that they need. That's why nurses are important. Having nurses in every school, I, it pains me sometimes to talk to schools prior to COVID to say, well, okay, 
do you have a, a nurse? And schools will say, well, we have a nurse once every five days because we share that nurse with four other schools, right? We can't say we're, that safety is our children's number one concern, but yet and still we don't have nurses in our schools, right? Full-time nurses at every school site should be a must, right? So that's one area. Another piece I would say from a policy standpoint that we've got to focus on, and look, we have been telling teachers, I want to advocate for teachers right here for a second. We've been advocating for teachers um, for a long time to engage in self-care, self-care, self-care. We need to change that language. We need to stop saying teachers engage in self-care. What we need to do is ask the question, what is it that creates the conditions that require that teachers have to have so much self-care in the first place? Why do we keep telling teachers to have self-care, but we don't change all the bureaucracy, all the politics, all the all the pressures that come down on teachers every single day. So instead of saying teacher self-care, change the conditions, change the environment, change the requirements that require teachers to have to have self-care. Teachers would need would need to have self-care if they were constantly being given more demands, more standards to meet, more responsibilities on their plate, uh, more uh, testing responsibilities. I'm saying stop it. The policy has to shift to the districts at the district level to put to stop putting so much additional responsibility on on teachers so teachers won't have to have self-care. So those are some things that come to mind for me. First and foremost, we should not be doing testing not only this year, we should not be testing next year either. The ramifications of this moment, what we've gone through for the past year plus three months is that children may have social emotional needs that will stay with them for five, six, seven, eight years out. So we can't think we can just put a Band-Aid on it for one year and then go back to normal. We have to think about this in a very different way and not go back to the same old business as usual. If we do that, shame on us. You're getting a lot of um, uh, chatter on the Zoom <laughs> chat, just a lot of um, thank you and yes, and um, just appreciate your remarks. Is there time for one more question, Jolene? If so, um there, there, there's a few questions. I'm sorry we can't get to all of them. Um, there's questions on uh, how to support LGBTQ students, questions about arts programming, questions about teacher training, mm -hmm. early childhood education. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't I don't know. There is a time to answer them all, but I, we hear you. Um, and th there was also a question about just like you mentioned um, anti-bias training and just like anti-racist education. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you want to like leave us with some last thoughts on how to yeah, foster yeah. an anti-racist education and also within that really also like multiracial solidarity. Yeah. We know LBUSD is a very, very diverse district. Mm -hmm. You know, we have um, high populations of students of color, um, diversity in so many ways. So if you would like to um, end on that note, thank you. Thank you for that, Angie. Let me say this, first and foremost, um, let's be clear about what anti-racism is. I think we gotta be committed to anti-racism because it's different than saying I'm not racist. To say I'm not racist means basically I see racism exists, but I just choose not to say or do anything about it. Anti-racism says I take an active stance to fight against policies, practices, or people who help to reinforce sort of this racial hierarchy that places black and brown and other children of color at the bottom of the spectrum and sort of lifts up uh, white supremacy. So part of what I've been telling folks during this moment around, yes, there needs to be multiracial solidarity because we have more in common than we have that is different. We share common struggles. We have unique needs, but we share common struggle. That is to be humanized. That is to be seen. That is to be heard. That is to be recognized. That is to hold on to our cultural integrity, to hold on to our language strengths. I mean, I look, we can talk all day about language because what pains me is the way in which we begin to try to erase culture and language when our young children bring so much powerful and beautiful language to our schools, yet we try to take that language away from them and replace it with English. It should not be replacement. It should be in addition to. But moreover, here's my task. My task is asking, look, because there are lots of folks in Long Beach who have been speaking up and speaking out against racism for a long time, and they should be applauded, and we should champion those folks. But in this moment and at this time, what I've been telling folks is that your silence on these issues makes you complicit in them, right? If you're choosing to be silent in the face of the exclusion of black and brown children, if you are choosing to be silent when you see black and brown educators being treated as less than, if you are silent when you see black and brown administrators being looked over time and time again for opportunity, if you are silent in the face of this racial 
reckoning moment, then you are part of the problem. And that goes for black folks, white folks, Latinx folks, indigenous folks. I'm not concerned about your skin color. I'm concerned about your consciousness, about the ways in which you are willing to stand up and speak out on behalf of those who are oftentimes most marginalized. See, that's what equity is. We use this term equity all the time, like it's just a great thing. But if we really want to do equity the right way, we're going to have to have some hard conversations. And part of what we have to do is get the folks who are quiet to recognize that they're part of the problem, right? You have to stop being on the sidelines saying, I'm not gonna get involved. It's not my issue, it's not my fight because if you choose to be quiet, you are part of the problem. We have folks who have been championing this cause for decades, speaking up, speaking out. Every time they come in the room, folks sigh, folks breathe, here they come again, right? They are there because they know if they don't raise the questions, if they don't pose the issues, if they don't challenge the status quo, that we'll stay in the same point. So I will leave you on the fact that each person has to ask him, her, or themselves, what is my commitment? What am I willing to stand up for? What am I willing to do? Long Beach is one of the most racially and ethnically diverse districts in all of Southern California, if not the state of California. If we don't serve our students better, then shame on us because we should be, again, not just a good district, but a great district. And the sign of a great district is how do you support the least amongst your students? You know who the least amongst your students are. We've talked about them. They're homeless students. They're language learners. They're students with disabilities, they're black students, they're PI students. If we're not putting out special initiatives to target the least amongst us, then we're not really about trying to be great. We're just going to be, we're going to settle for being good, or in some cases being settled, settle for just being mediocre. So that means in this racial reckoning moment, we have to all dedicate ourselves to being anti-racist in our curriculum, in our instruction, in our relationships, in our policies, and with the people that we bring in to be a part of our school communities. Thank you for leaving us with that powerful message, Dr. Howard, and for taking us to school today and bringing it back to where you started and sharing your own personal story. Um, so with that, I, I believe uh, this concludes the keynote address. I, I am I um, transitioning to Lilia and just want to thank you, Dr. Howard, for being here with us today. Thank you, Angie. Oh, uh, hello everyone. My name is Lilia Ocampo and I am a parent in Long Beach Unified District. I am the vice president of DILAT and we will now begin to close our program. If you can stay until 1230, we would love uh, to have a deeper dialogue with you in the breakout rooms. In a few moments, I'll share more information about that. First, I want to thank all of you, our students, parents, community members, teachers, executive staff, and school board members for making time to participate in this forum today. We will go further if we work together. Also, I want to thank our keynote speaker, Dr. Tyrone Howard, for being our teacher today. And lastly, thank you all of the planners of this event. This has been a special collaboration of LBUSD Children's Defense Fund, California, Latinos in Action, California, Parent Organization Network, and Public Advocates. A very special thank you goes to our parent leaders, Mariela Salgado, Kim Tabari, and to Jerlyn Tatum, who has led our team in hosting this event. At this time, I'd like to ask planning committee members to come off camera so they can see you. Can every can everyone ca come show to the camera, please? Thank you to our LBSD tech team. So can you see? I'm not sure if we're if we're pinned or if we're spotlighted. But if we um, the team and our district team. Yeah, I'm working on spotlighting everyone. Can I just throw in a big thank you to our translators and interpreters? There you are again. Thank you for making this, this event possible. You can go off now. <laughs> the surveys are short and will tell us how we do, how can improve in the future. You can feel out now or before you log off. Or if you can complete it now, then open the link so you can come back to it later. 
I also want to remind you that there are many stakeholder engagement opportunities coming up, including school world and public hearing. Thank you, Lilia. I believe we have Nicole. Great, thanks so much, Lilia, and thank you everyone for participating. We know it's been kind of a, um, you know, you've maybe been here for a long time, but if you can stay for another uh, half an hour, we'd love to have you participate in the optional breakouts um, where we can delve more deeply into one or more of these topics. So um, I'm gonna give you instructions now on how to get into the breakout rooms. Um, 